Well, the 2012 Republican National Convention is over, and Mitt Romney has been nominated as the party's official presidential candidate, along with Paul Ryan as the vice presidential candidate. And now the countdown towards the November elections has officially begun. Now, in the weeks ahead, you and I are we're going to begin hearing soaring rhetoric from both sides of the political aisle as to why their chosen leader will offer the most effective leadership over the next four years. And the stench of the propaganda spewing out of our elected leaders' mouths from both sides of the aisle will only be trumped by the corporate-controlled media's amplification of their talking points. As I reflect upon last weekend's Republican National Convention, I am saddened, truly deeply saddened for America. It seems that the nomination of a presidential candidate has never been so polarizing and exploited by the media. When America's founders created this nation, they worked diligently to create a new nation that would have strong congressional powers that could easily check the powers of the executive branch. Today, America's executive branch has grown virtually unchecked with a wide swath of executive powers, including executive orders and decrees, memorandums, proclamations, national security directives, and legislative signing statements. In his book, The Cult of the Presidency, America's Dangerous Devotion to Executive Power, author Gene Healy explains that America seems to have embraced this tumorous growth of executive powers, leading voters to expect the president to drive the economy, vanquish enemies, lead the free world, comfort tornado victims, heal the national soul, and protect borrowers from hidden credit card fees. To witness just how far America's overdependence upon the executive branch has become, simply listen to the absurd questions that will likely be presented to the candidates in the upcoming presidential elections in October. Some of the questions that the two presidential candidates will be faced with in October will likely include, how many jobs will you create? Or, how will you solve America's economic crisis? Or, what is your view on gay marriage? etc., etc. And while these questions should be expected, it is regrettable that most Americans believe these issues to be the sole domain of the president. Shocking as it may be, there is no constitutional mandate upon the president to create jobs for the American people. And while he should certainly be expected to foster a positive economic tone for the country, the best thing that the president can do is shrink the size of government to provide room for the free market to operate. Additionally, the Constitution does not task the president with solving economic crises. Governments are incapable of helping free markets through growing their powers in size and scope. In our present era, the economy is managed by fiscal and monetary policy, neither of which the president has sole control or power over. Meanwhile, the domain of monetary policy belongs exclusively to the Federal Reserve. In fact, the Fed is the only institution that I know of that is specifically tasked and even mandated with creating policies that promote maximum employment. And the question of gay marriage simply cuts to the quick over the size of government. Is it not mind-boggling that conservatives who claim to want limited government expect the President of the United States to dictate the nation's morality? When the federal government can reach into your bedroom and my bedroom, something has gone terribly wrong, and indeed it already has. I believe that those who are adamantly seeking to outlaw gay marriage should seek to do so at the state level and cease their attempts to place more dictatorial powers into the hands of Washington. And what is interesting is that while the economy and gay marriage will likely be hot topics for the election of 2012, I predict that the upcoming debates will be eerily silent on the topics of drone warfare, America's secret prisons, the worthless fiat money issued by the fraudulent Federal Reserve, and the unpatriotic Patriot Act. And what about the TSA, which is increasingly treating Americans like criminals? Or the reckless NDAA, that is the National Defense Authorization Act, which currently permits a sitting president to arrest and detain American citizens indefinitely without pressing charges. 
and it is highly doubtful that either Mr. Obama or Mr. Romney will discuss the need to slow down the U.S. military war machine. Neither one of them will be asked about the hundreds of innocent civilians who are routinely killed in foreign lands under the cover of darkness by the U.S. Special Operations Command, which is the president's own elite and private army. But more important than their civil rights and their freedom, Americans just seem to want jobs. Mr. President, just give us jobs and we'll let you fly drones over our homes spying on us from the sky. Mr. President, just fix our economy and we won't complain when the state slides their hands down our pants to make sure we are not terrorists. And sure, let us send our wives and our parents, even take our children and put them through your naked body scanners. Just give us cheaper gas prices, Mr. President. Mr. President, just give me more take-home pay, and I will ignore the fact that the money that I am receiving is completely worthless paper, backed up by a crumbling petrodollar system which is barely held together through brute military force around the globe. Interestingly, there was one presidential candidate within the flurry of Republican candidates in 2012 who had spent his entire political career trying to correct what is wrong with Washington. His name is Ron Paul. Now, during the Republican convention last week, Ron Paul and his supporters took their last stand of this election cycle. Tensions flared as RNC leaders sought to change the rules at the last minute to prevent Ron Paul's delegates from being seated and therefore counted. Now, one of those rules is Rule 16, which will forever change the way that the Republican Party selects its candidates. In essence, this rule gives the establishment candidate, the presumptive candidate, and the state party exclusive power to replace a delegate if they don't like them. A simple reading of the text of this rule provoked Tea Party advocates, grassroots activists, and true conservatives to anger, as it was obviously an attempt by the Republican establishment to quell any and all objections to their preordained candidate. In traditional fashion, the vote for Rule 16 was held on the convention floor through a vocal vote. Listen now as I play for you the actual audio from the convention vote with Representative John Boehner presiding. The question is on the adoption of the resolution. All those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed, no. We need another chair. The ayes have it. The resolution's adopted. It was pretty clear to the people on the floor that the RNC was going to ramrod and railroad this right through without any concern for those who did not want to see the rule passed, despite the fact that there were several, several no's. This was an unbelievable dereliction of duty and political power right there on display for everyone to see. And thanks to the proliferation of smartphones, a convention attendee was able to capture the teleprompter that Representative John Bader was reading from, and it showed that the entire issue was scripted. There was never going to be a chance for the no's to be heard. This fully exposed the wicked plan that had been hatched in secret. Thank you. Without objection, the previous question is order. The question is on the adoption of the resolution. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Ron Paul's candidacy has been faced with this same type of hostility at the caucus level, at the district and state conventions, and now the nation has had a chance to see how the Republican Party treats not just Ron Paul, but all grassroots activists and the Tea Party who are seeking to change the direction of this country. Mr. Paul has spent his entire career attempting to expose the Federal Reserve to return our country to a sound monetary system, to deal equitably and peaceably with other nations, to restore real liberty and freedom to America, and to respect our military by not forcing them to risk their lives in the name of cheap gas prices and a failing petrodollar system. Put simply, 
Mr. Paul is a man of peace. But in a nation that maintains its economic stature and monetary system through the barrel of a gun, a man of peace is the most dangerous of breeds. Why? Because war is profitable and requires the funding of the Federal Reserve Central Bank. That is why the corporate-controlled mainstream media literally poisoned the minds of Americans regarding Mr. Paul and his views. Recently, a reader wrote in to tell me that they agreed with Mr. Ron Paul on his economics and agreed that the Federal Reserve should be ended. But then he wrote that Mr. Paul's foreign policy was what prevented him from voting for him. I replied back by explaining to this man that without a Federal Reserve, the incentives and the financial backing for war would be nearly impossible. Put simply, America cannot fight an endless war without a printing press. Wars and central banks go hand in hand, and they have for centuries. Now, America has had lots of warnings over the years. Back in 1961, oh, I guess over 50 years ago now, President Dwight D. Eisenhower was giving his farewell address from the Oval Office on January 17th, 1961. I'm going to play the tape for you. I'm going to play a very brief part of it. You can listen to the whole thing on our website. He warns about something he calls the military-industrial complex. If you've never heard this before, it's very important that you listen closely. Listen to the warning that he is issuing. Here is a man who is on the inside. You don't get any more on the inside than the United States president. And President Eisenhower warns us of the complications and, of course, the stripping of our freedom and our liberties due to the military-industrial complex. My fellow Americans, this evening I come to you with a message of leave-taking and farewell and to share a few final thoughts with you, my countrymen. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. One of the most profound statements ever uttered by a U.S. president, in my opinion, on the same magnitude as Washington's farewell address when he warned about foreign entanglements. And I believe we have violated both. I believe we have entered a time where we have been completely strangled by the military-industrial complex and we have gotten ourselves completely entangled in foreign countries. Sadly, the warfare state that has been created in America has taken a tremendous toll upon our brave men and women in uniform. They enlisted with great dreams of defending our country's shores, only to find themselves stationed in some faraway land that poses no direct threat to our nation's borders. America is falling apart before our very eyes. The nation that boldly proclaims, in God we trust, is being suffocated in the final stages of greed's tightening grasp. And sadly, the corporate-controlled mainstream media has struck gold, exploiting the humiliating political blame game. So who should you vote for? Mr. Romney or Mr. Obama? Well, ask yourself... Which one of these two will bring our troops home and end the senseless wars that have murdered literally millions of innocent civilians in foreign nations over the last decade? Which one of these two candidates will end the Federal Reserve and get rid of our worthless fiat currency and again restore our country to a sound money? Or which candidate will make radical cuts to the size and scope of government and make it less intrusive into our everyday lives? 
Or which candidate will restore the basic liberties and freedoms to America by overturning tyrannical legislation like the Unpatriotic Patriot Act and the NDAA? Sadly, the only candidate that promised to do all of those things was railroaded by the establishment at last week's Republican National Convention. Friends, you are being lied to. It's time to wake up. <laughs> 